is um, uh, these are my disclosures uh, that I work for some of the industry as well. Uh, what I'm going to do is to go through the principles of management, the choice of the acute and preventive treatment for migraine, and the evidence behind uh, choosing an acute and preventive treatment. So which one is better and how uh, you should choose your own treatment uh, and what's the availability of the current regime. We then would come a little bit about um, some treatments that are there, but have a very limited availability or because of the poor recommendation by the NICE and the NHS. So you will be struggling to get it on the NHS, but just to be aware of that these are available. And then I think we're going to spend a little bit of time on the new treatment, particularly the CGRP monoclonal antibody, which is the talk of the town at the moment. And then there are a couple of treatments that are going to be available later on this year, hopefully, if the things uh, go through the <coughs> EMA and uh, MHRA. And then we'll have to see whether NICE approves it on the NHS. Uh, I'm going to leave plenty of time for uh, question and answer. So, so, you know, I think this is more important that I answer things that are you, you would like me to answer uh, would be better than just doing the lecture as such. So what do we want to know about the treatment of migraines? What are the general principles? Particularly, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the lifestyle. Then there are two basic types of treatment. One is acute treatment that you actually take as and when you have a migraine attack or when you have an acute migraine attack as such or a sudden headaches. On what principle and what choice we have. Then we're gonna cover about preventive treatment. What are the principles of using them and what are the current choices we have got it available. And then obviously uh, we'll go for uh, what are the treatments on the horizon. So let's start with the general principle. I think it is very important that we manage expectations of uh, the patient and empower the patient because at the end of the day, it's the patient who experienced the headache and the disability. And we have to be very honest about what do we uh, expect them to find when the treatment is given. I give you an example. A lot of times when I give treatment to the patient asking them to fill in a diary and people come back and the diary clearly shows that they have improved an awful lot. But when we ask them whether they had any benefit, they would say, no, I didn't have any benefit because I thought the treatment um, you were giving me would wipe off my headache completely. So basically, I think it was my fault that I didn't get the expectation right. Um, and therefore, if you don't get the expectation right, then it is very difficult to judge uh, if a treatment is doing anything. So I think the, the correct way to say that you'll have to live with a migraine for the rest of your life. Um, it's like any, any other illnesses. You've got diabetes, you would have to live with diabetes forever. All you can do is take medication or do something in your diet to help you live a normal life. Same applies with migraine, that you have to do adjust your lifestyle to such a thing that it doesn't bother you much. And you have to uh, know the treatments that you can take as and when things get worse. And then you just have to live with it for the rest of your life, but make it livable, basically. So the doctor has to really inform you that there is no cure for it. I think I can't see any cure for over the next 50 years. Um, there may be a cure in you know, 100 years. I mean, if we can land on Mars, we can find a cure of things. But what I can see, apart from some of the cancers 
We've never found cure for anything. Look at diabetes, look at high blood pressure, look at heart problems, look at kidney problems. We've never had a cure for anything, really. The infection is the only thing that you could say, okay, take antibiotics and the infection goes away. So not a big surprise as such. I think the underlying worry the patients usually have is um, whether they have got anything sinister. And they're not wrong in assuming that. If I have got a lot of pain uh, and somebody tells me and says, um, there's nothing wrong with you, then I would be very offended because I'm the one who's suffering from pain. But it still would help to say, look, you know, there isn't anything life-threatening. We do understand your disability. We do understand you've got a headache. It is a condition that needs to be managed. It's a condition that you would have uh, to take some treatment. But the reassurance bit is that it is not something that's going to kill you. And it is not something that's going to make you physically disabled. And we'll do everything to make you mentally stable so that the migraine doesn't rule you and you have to rule over migraine. I think in this 21st century, uh, empowering patients is the key. Particularly, I have seen over the last one year in the pandemic that we are now doing loads of telephone consultations, um, which were not heard of before 2020. And um, we are providing the information. We are just signposting things. And we are asking patients to seek knowledge and we are the one to facilitate and guide them about which is the right source of information, what is the right information and uh, try to put them off uh, seeing things that are not relevant to their condition. So if, if you know your condition very well, then you probably know much more than your physician because you are the one who's suffering from it and then the knowledge of the condition. So you only need guidance from your physician as and when you need it. Um, lifestyle advice is, is, is good. We usually have headache specialist nurses that spends more time uh, with the patient. I always say that there isn't any trigger that affects you. There is a combination of triggers that affects you. I see one in a 500 patients who would come and say, well, I only get migraine when I have orange juice, or, when I, or, or I have a migraine when I take, uh, when I eat cheese, or when I have chocolate, or when I have red wine. Usually, patients tell me, I don't really know what's triggering my migraine, and I have tried to come off plenty of food items, but nothing is helping me. And the reason behind it is, it's a combination of triggers. So there are food triggers, there are triggers in the environment, the weather, uh, hormones in women, your sleeping pattern, your eating pattern, the amount of carbohydrates or sugar you, you take. There are loads of things that can happen. And basically there are two ways that you could um, alter your chances of getting migraine. One is to try and get all those hundreds of factors under control, which you can't, or make you stronger by raising your threshold of having a headache. Always remember that migraine sufferers are no different from anybody else who doesn't have headaches or migraine. The only difference is that the threshold where you get the headache is lower in migraineurs and is higher in non-migraineurs. So therefore, even a non-migraineur, if you provoke them sufficiently, they would end up getting a headache. And the commonest example is hangover. And I have not come across anybody uh, who drinks alcohol to, that, that would say that he never had or she never had a hangover. So provoked enough, everybody would get a headache but migraineurs have got a low threshold and the triggers that can cause headache, which are, as I say, there are hundreds of them, can trigger a migraine attack in these people. 
if you raise the threshold level and make them a bit more resistant or intractable, you can actually reduce the occurrence of migraine. There is some room for behavior therapy, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. I haven't used that much, but obviously there are papers to suggest that it does help in some people um, uh, in, in reducing the attacks of migraine. And going back again to the lifestyle, I think it's always good to have a good night's sleep. It's always good to eat on time. It's always good to have a balanced diet, keep yourself hydrated, try and maintain a, a balanced lifestyle. I don't eat plenty of coffee, you know, don't take plenty of uh, caffeine. Um, try and take caffeine moderately or and keep a balance through the week. I mean, the commonest thing is a lot of people get migraine on a Saturday because uh, their coffee consumption from Monday to Friday remains very high and then it drops down and you get a withdrawal headache. So a balanced diet and a balanced lifestyle is always helpful. So how, how about an acute treatment? Um, so what's the principle? So there are two ways of managing an acute attack. And that is, you take the most appropriate treatment from the word go. So your doctor may think that you, you know, the best treatment for you may be immigrant or a tryptan. Um, and, and if you take that tryptan and you respond really well, then you should have tryptan for every migraine attack. There is a different approach, what we call a stepped approach, means you always start with paracetamol. You then move up with the non-steroidal drugs like ibuprofen and if paracetamol and non-steroidal or ibuprofen doesn't help, then you obviously move on to tryptin. So that's what you call a stepped approach. I don't think that stepped approach is good enough because there is no point in experimenting. It used to be the case when the tryptan first came in the market in the early 90s. But now tryptan is a standard treatment. We are actually even moving beyond tryptan in the next uh, year or so. So I think the, the physician would assess what is the best treatment for you. So say if you um, say I get about two or three attacks of migraine a month and no more than that, and they last for a good few hours or a day, I think that you should be tried tryptin from the word go. Um, there's no point in trying uh, paracetamol ibuprofen. If tryptin doesn't work, then you can take a U-turn and go back to paracetamol or ibuprofen. If you say I'm getting about 10 to 12 days of headache per month, and your GP is creating some problems and giving you tryptins and we worry that you might start to take loads of tryptin, not only for the cost thing, but also for the frequency of thing, then simple painkillers may be a better option. And in that case, you would probably say, okay, try to cover some of your mild to moderate headache with the simple painkillers and restrict your tryptin for severe ones. So that's again, a stratified approach. Uh, what is the best treatment for you? Always remember, that if a treatment doesn't give you any benefit in two hours, it's not going to give you any benefit. So therefore, you can take a rescue medication if your headache is not better in two hours, because two hours is the, is the usual optimum period where all the trials have been assessed with for the medication. Always remember, do not take anything that has got opioids or codeine in it. Most of the medication you will see from the supermarkets have got codeine in it. So Sindol, Sulpidine, Capeg, Cocodamol, Codidamol, Coproxamol, all of these have got codeine in it. And codeine is very well known to cause medication rebound headaches. What is codeine? I mean, codeine is the younger brother of heroin, and you all have heard about heroin. 
So heroin, um, and then the, the, the next to heroin is morphine, which you've heard of in given in surgery, then pethidine, and then below pethidine is codeine. So they all belong to the same family. They are very effective painkillers. As a matter of fact, they are wonderful painkillers, but they should only be used for occasional use for surgery or very severe pain and like myocardial infarction or heart attacks or when you are undergoing post-operative pain. They are not good for use for mild to moderate or moderate to severe daily pain because they would get you better very quickly. But then as soon as they come out of the system, the pain would come back and you would get into a vicious circle where you're better when you take the painkiller and you're worse when you don't take them. So definitely there is no role for opioids in treatment of mine. There are some facts that you might want to know about triptans. They don't work when you take during the aura. So when you're having uh, flashing lines, zigzag lines, or a warning symptoms of migraine, there is no point in taking any triptan because it wouldn't work. You might want to take in a way that if you are sure that they are coming on, they would be followed by a headache in 45 minutes. And because the painkiller does take about two hours to start working in, you might want to take from that perspective, but don't expect that uh, when you take it during the aura that the aura will stop. So as early as possible in the headache, uh, you can take it during the aura if you know that the headache is on its way in a few minutes. If you take a trip and it doesn't work, try again. If you have tried two or three times and a triptan doesn't work, then switch it to other triptan. It's not a class effect. So if you do not respond to sumatriptan, you might want you might respond to another triptan like naratriptan or zolmitriptan or rizotriptan. Uh, but there are 30% people, about one in three people who would never respond to triptan. And that is sort of a, a disadvantage is that not everybody, not 100% people would respond to a triptan. So what are the simple painkillers? Now they are just arranged in an alphabetical order and they are all equally well because they are all shown um, in the trials to be effective. Um, most commonly used after the paracetamol, all the others are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like to, belonging to a group of ibuprofen. They are anti-inflammatory means um, they would suppress any inflammation that you may have uh, during a migraine attack in your uh, cranial vessels or cranial brain covering. Uh, a lot of people use diclofenac. Ibuprofen is the most common use. My favorite is naproxen, uh, comes in 250 and 500 milligram. Uh, Tolfenamic acid uh, is another one, but you know, not many people commonly use it. So you can use any of these if, if, if it's available. And sometimes it happens that people don't respond to ibuprofen, but will respond to naproxen or the other way around. So try any of them. After that, we have triptans, and these are the triptans that we have got it available. Most of them are oral. There are some that are available as a nasal spray. So if you are vomiting, if you feel very much nauseous, and if you feel that due to nausea or vomiting, the tablets would not even get absorbed through your stomach and therefore would not get into the system to make you better, use the spray, if not use the injection. So that's the range of treatment available. Again, they are in the alphabetical order, so it's not being the elbow is any better. Um, we usually use either sumatriptan tablets or spray. And in if you get occasional headaches, then it's much, much better to use injection because it is expensive. But if you are only requiring it once a month or once every four to six weeks, it's better to use the injection because it works very quickly. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, you'll be back to you know, normal. If you're getting frequent attacks, then I think it's cost-wise, it's also a problem. And also, um, you don't want to be taking it too frequently as such. Uh, Frovatriptan is good because it's got a longer duration of action. 
So it start to work in about four to six hours rather than two hours. But once it start working, it works for about 30 hours. So therefore, uh, proatriptan would give you a longer lasting benefit uh, that will be effective for two days. And if you've got a longer duration of uh, migraine, proatriptan is better. But you don't want to wait six hours for the drug to work. So therefore, I usually suggest to people that you combine proatriptan with either ibuprofen or naproxen because they would work within a couple of hours and would work for six to eight hours. And proatriptan would start in six to eight hours and work for 30 hours. So this is why my favorite combination is that I give people proatriptan with um, naproxen, but you can do sumatriptan with uh, uh, ibuprofen. There is, there is study to show that striptin works with the ibuprofen, they do work better if taken together. Now, which tryptin is better? Because you've got loads of them available. Um, obviously, from the point of view of how quickly it works, so much tryptin, six so milligrams. Uh, so, so much tryptin, six milligrams, subcut injection is the most effective. You're going upstairs now. Quicker. I think somebody's mic is open. Um, so six milligram subcut injection is the most rapid one. Um, if you if you are getting side effects, you could choose Naramig, Almotriptan, or Provotriptan because they have got low side effect profile. Quicker to act is obviously Alitriptan, Rizotriptan, and Almotriptan. So work much more quicker, better response at two hours. And if you are looking for uh, a longer acting migraine attack than protriptan and elitriptan is better. So you could, you know, use a, a particular triptan based upon your need. So now how to prevent it? Um, the general opinion is that if you have less than four days of headache or migraine in a month, then it's not worth taking a tablet every day to prevent them because the best it would do is reduce from four days to two days, but then you are exposing yourself to a drug for 30 days to gain two, two days. So the best thing is that you should take an effective acute treatment to try and make your attack shorter and quickly recover from an attack and try and avoid a regular use of drug taking every day to prevent them. So that's a normal consensus, but obviously it varies from individual to individual. You might get four days that are so bad that you can't really function and you can't have four days off sick every month. <coughs> Excuse me. So therefore, uh, in some cases, we do think about preventive treatment, but the general consensus is that if it is less than four days, try and have good acute treatment. If it is start to four to six days um, with, with, with a lot of impairment, then you should consider, but if you're getting six days or more, then you should really be on preventive treatment. I mean, this uh, is based on the principle that you, the, the, if the benefit of the treatment is more than the uh, disadvantages of side effects that you're going to get. So it's the benefit risk ratio that we usually consider. If you do start to take preventive treatment, the general principle is that there is no single treatment that fits one for all. It depends upon who you are, what you do, what age you are, and what job uh, stress or other stress, home stress you have. So if you are a, a young woman between 18 and 45 and you're looking to start family and you might get pregnant, you don't want to take a particular drug like topiramate. If you are asthmatic, then obviously beta blocker is not the right choice for you. If you feel that you're also very anxious, um, 
hemitriptyline may be suitable. I mean, we'll cover that in the next few slides, but I'm just saying that uh, there is no one treatment. You can't just say that, oh, my friend was given a uh, drug A, can I have a drug A? Because you might not suit that drug A, the drug B might be suitable for you. So if you've got a low blood pressure, beta blockers and one or two other drugs may not be suitable. So let physician guide you and appraise you about, he would explain to you why is he choosing that on what basis. And I think a good physician should really appraise you about the choice of treatment and what does he think would be best for you. And if there are two or three drugs that are better for you, then he'll ask you to choose, uh, giving you the pros and cons of them. Now remember, all the drugs that are used for prevention of migraine, there are very few head-to-head -head studies. So there are very few studies that compare A with B or A with C or B with C. They're all compared with placebo. Most of the trials are done with placebo. So therefore, if they are better than placebo, then they are marketed. Um, so it is very difficult for the physician to tell you why well, I think A is better than B, because I think A was better than placebo, B was better than placebo, but we don't know whether A is better than B or not. So it's not the efficacy that he is going to try to convince you. Uh, it is the uh, other things that, uh, like I said, your age and uh, your job and uh, other uh, factors in your life. Whatever you start, start with a lower dose because people do differ in terms of the tolerability. I mean, I know there are people who take 10 milligrams of hemichiptyline and can't get up till 6 p.m. the next day. And I've seen people taking 200 milligrams of hemichiptyline and come back and say, I can't sleep. So that's the two bigger, you know, totally different ranges of problem. So start with a lower dose and build that up very gradually permitting side effects to a maximum dose. And if you get to a maximum dose, a maximum tolerable dose, and if it doesn't work for a couple of months, and that's, that's where you can say, well, this treatment doesn't work. Or if you can't tolerate it, then obviously there is no point in going to the maximum dose. Once it works, you continue that for about six to 12 months. And then after that, uh, usually the, the physician would try to ask you to gradually come off the treatment. Uh, and every time you come off the treatment and your migraine comes back, then he has a good reason for you to continue for a long time. But it is not a good idea to take a prophylaxis and then forget about it and then find out that 10 years down the line, you are still on that treatment. You should give a trial to come off the drug uh, to see whether you can manage without them. There are some tools that physicians use, and one of them is like a HIT-6. And people who come to my clinic I always get people to do a HIT-6 score, which gives an idea about whether the treatment is working for you or not. So what are the choices of preventive treatment? So these are the total range. So these are all in red is one that is available. So propranolol is a beta blocker, means when you get a fight, flight, and fight or fear reaction, there is adrenaline secreted in your body and that's what causes you to have tachycardia, palpitation, and then can give you a headache as well. So propranolol blocks the release of adrenaline and in, in some way prevents you getting the, the headaches. Um, antidepressants like amitriptyline and some drugs used for epilepsy like topiramate and apilin. Uh, some drugs that use for blood pressure are uh, candisartan and lysinopril. There are some drugs that work for uh, have a different mechanism of action like flunarazine you might have heard about and we have got botox if you have chronic migraine um, you've got magnesium riboflavin coenzyme q10 there are three that are available from the health shops um, and then there are some other drugs uh, like gadgets and the nerve block and the new drugs so this is the range of treatment you have now if you go to the doctor for the very first time he might not discuss all of them with you. He might only discuss with you 
propranolol, amitriptyline, topiramate, and kendisartan. That's the first four drugs that he would discuss with you. Apilin, we stopped using it now. We very rarely use apilin. So propranolol, amitriptyline, topiramate, and kendisartan. He'll discuss with you these four. And if you are through these four, then he can discuss with you drugs like lisinopril, flunarazine, Botox, and others. So let's let's see what uh, uh, what the uh, recommendation is for NICE and for the British Society of Headache. So the four common drugs, as I said, would be discussed with you is amitriptyline, candesartan, propranolol, and topiramate. It's in the alphabetical order, so it doesn't mean amitriptyline is better than topiramate. Now, amitriptyline has got a stigma that this is an antidepressant. And a lot of times, if I don't tell people, they would then say, oh, you gave me a drug for depression. That's why I didn't take it, because I'm not depressed. Well, the chemical related to depression is serotonin. And there are drugs that work for, you know, uh, act on serotonin can, can uh, treat migraine. So therefore, it's the same receptor. So therefore, amitriptyline is not only an antidepressant. Well, as a matter of fact, I would rarely see anybody using amitriptyline for depression now because there are much better drugs available for depression. So amitriptyline use is now only for nerve pains and migraine. Um, propranolol is my favorite and I use it in everyone apart from people that have got asthma because it does make your asthma worse and you can't tolerate it. So my first two drugs would be amitriptyline or propranolol. And these two drugs are very safe in pregnancy in a low dose. They have the least side effect. I mean, with amitriptyline, you might feel a bit drowsy in the first few days and have difficulty getting up in the morning. But then once you get used to the side effect, it's brilliant. Propranolol occasionally can give you bad dreams. But apart from that, really, very rarely I can see that people are having you know, weight gain and other things. So amitriptyline and propranolol are the two best. If these two don't work, my third choice, or if, they, if, you, if you are not able to tolerate them or if you have got asthma, my third choice is candesartan. It's a blood pressure treatment. And if you have low blood pressure, you might not want to take the candesartan, um, but it's got a better side effect profile. And my fourth is topiramate. And there are three reasons for not using topiramate earlier. One is uh, it gives you a lot of pins and needles in the hands and feet, which is not bad because people would be able to tolerate that. It also causes you to weight, lose weight. That's not bad either. People actually like it. But the third side effect that people get is that you can't think straight. You can't concentrate, you feel forgetful, you start having problem with memory, you feel like a zombie, you even forget that you have taken the tablet uh, on that morning, and that's not very good. Plus, if you are 18 to 45, it would interfere with your pill, and it would have a very bad effect on pregnancy if you get pregnant. So therefore, for a fertile age group, I don't choose to pyramid. I go for the other three, propranolol, kenesartan, and amitriptyline. And then Botox, if cost was not an issue, my treatment of first choice for chronic migraine would have been Botox. But because it is expensive, NICE tells you and NHS tells you that you only use it if you have failed three drugs, which would obviously mean of these four, then I go for Botox. But if the cost wasn't an issue, Botox would have been the, the best treatment for chronic migraine. So once you are through these uh, four treatments, then you can uh, sometimes give a nerve block. Now nerve block works, 50% people get about 50% better. Um, so that's how it helps. We think that there are two nerves at the back of your head called greater and lesser occipital nerve. They take the message from outside of your head to inside. If you block these two nerves, you actually block the gateway of getting the message to your brain. And therefore, uh, it gives you a, a temporary improvement for a few weeks 
and it actually buys you some time for the other medication if you're taking to, to prevent it to work because not all medication works straight away. So if they take a few weeks to work, this would buy some time for you. As I mentioned, Botox is probably my uh, first choice treatment for chronic migraine if cost was not an issue. And if you have failed two or three drugs, then the NHS would recommend that you have Botox. We give you two treatments three months apart. If both of them fail to make, any, make you any better, then obviously we stop the treatment. But if it works, you may, you want to have that treatment really. Um, and about half of the patients that I start on Botox would uh, be able to stop the treatment in two years. And another half, uh, well, another 25% um, by five years. And there are about one in four patients, 25% patients would need Botox forever because whenever you stop it, you start getting worse. So therefore you have to continue treatment. And then that is the case with all the preventive treatment. There are 10 to 20% patients that would need preventive treatment forever. So that same applies with Botox as well. So there are three gadgets that are uh, available, um, but obviously NICE does not recommend to come with the cost. NICE approves their use, but it doesn't come with the cost. So you have to fund it yourself. And they are expensive. So one of that is the TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, it's basically, uh, you, you know, basically a mini MRI scan. So you basically put the device on the back of your head and press the button and it, it would release magnetic waves that would pass through your head and disturb your brain in a nicer way to terminate a migraine attack. Um, it's usually good for if you have got a uh, aura and you take the, uh, give yourself the uh, stimulus, then you could stop your migraine during the stage of aura and would not develop the headache. Um, I used it for about two, three hundred patients when it first came in about seven, eight years ago. Um, and I found it quite good. In about 60% of my patients uh, had benefit, 40% patient didn't get benefit. The problem is that it costed about two, 150 pound a month. And NHS does not approve funding, and it's very difficult for anyone to continue to fund herself or himself 1800 pound a year for the rest of your life to just treat your migraine attack. So that's why I think it's fizzled away now. And um, um, I think the company stopped marketing it in the UK. They're still doing it in the USA. The second machine or gadget is the Gamma Core. So Gamma Core, uh, you put it on the right side of your neck, it stimulates your vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve would then take the message to the brain and disturbs it in a nicer way and can terminate your migraine attack. And if you use it regularly every day, five times a day or four times a day, it can prevent you getting the migraine. But its mainly, um, its, its main data comes for cluster headache. Uh, the data for migraine is not that convincing. So therefore, uh, NHS has approved with the funding for cluster, but not for migraine. And the third gadget is uh, Kefali, which is like wearing your glasses on your forehead. They stimulate the nerves on your forehead. Um, and that's how they work. That's the device that is available on Amazon, or you can go directly to their website. You pay 250 pound to get the uh, get the device. Um, you use it for three months. If it works for you, you can keep them. If it doesn't work, you send them back. You lose 50 pounds and you get your 200 pounds back. Nice has approved it, but once again, it doesn't come with the funding. So NHS does not uh, approve the funding. Uh, I have few patients that are using it and getting benefit from it. Not a huge number of people are benefiting from it, but there is a small population that does get benefit. It's not that expensive. Uh, it's not 150 pound a month, but it, 
is 250 to buy it and then you keep it and all you would need is like the pad that you use cost you about 20 pound every three months for the pad your doctor might sometimes talk to you about IV dihydrogotamine. This is done in very refractory cases. If the doctor has tried you on everything, every possible thing and nothing is working, they might consider you for uh, a treatment of an infusion that you get every day for five days, intravenous dihydrogotamine. And basically it is used to reset the clock. So all the prevention treatment that you have tried in the past, if they haven't worked, may start working again if you have that infusion for five days. Unfortunately, this is only available in a few centers in the UK, two, three centers in London, and I think there is one in Stoke. Uh, not every uh, center has that facility. So let's talk about CGRP monoclonal antibody. So. The new drug, monthly injections, very popular these days, everybody is talking about it. We think that ultimately the pain in migraine that you get is because of a chemical which is called CGRP. And you don't have to remember the name. It's a long name. It's a very long name, um, but you don't have to remember it. The chemical CGRP causes inflammation of your brain coverings and your blood vessels where the pain receptors or the pain sensation there and it causes the pain. If you have something that blocks that CGRP chemical, then it would prevent you getting the pain. There were drugs that were developed earlier, but they were unsuccessful or they had side effects. So therefore they have developed an antibody to the CGRP and that neutralizes the chemical and therefore prevents you getting the pain. The good thing is that um, it's the first ever medicine that has been developed purely for migraine prevention. So it's not a blood pressure treatment, it's not an epilepsy treatment, it's not a treatment that um, is given for uh, depression or anything, uh, it is for migraine. Secondly, it's the once a month injection, you give yourself at home. It's like an EpiPen, it's like an insulin injection, it's like uh, uh, the Imigron subcut injection. So it's very easy. And the third thing is all the trials have shown that the side effect that uh, people reported were very similar to the placebo. And the most common ones are a bit of dizziness and constipation. So it's not relatively free of side effects. So these are the four ones. You, you don't have to remember any of those. So we have got aptinizumab, which is still in the trial, still being tried. We got arinumab, which was the first one to come out in the market. We got galcanizumab, that is now we are prescribing this A. Jovi. Um, sorry, no, 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 I've uh, made a mistake. Frimazinumab is the one which is A. Jovi, that is we currently prescribing. And galcanizumab is gonna be available within the next couple of months. So adenumab is Amovig, which first came, but NICE did not approve it. Now they have approved it. The second one came was A. Jovi of Primazinumab that we are currently prescribing. And this is called Amgality Galcanizumab, which is approved by NICE and should be available within the next few weeks. That's what they look like. So this is Amgality on the left. This is what you are getting A. Jovi majority of our patients. And this is the AMOVIG, which is still approved by NICE now, uh, obviously uh, is third to enter the market. And there will be a fourth one, which we said, uh, I just want you to look at this graph. Basically it shows how many people would get 50% better if you, they are given the medication. So look at Botox, compared to placebo, 12% more people would get 50% better. So pyramid, 10% more people get better than placebo. And, and that percentage that I'm referring to is called therapeutic gain. That is, this is the benefit you get on top of placebo. If you look at these four new antibodies, this is 16% more better. This is 17%. This is 23%. And this is 12%. 
So the, the one which we are now using, frimazinumab, 23% better than placebo compared to 10, 12% in Botox and 10% in topiramate. So you can imagine that the gain with these new drugs is much better than the existing treatment. So that's one thing that I wanted to show you. The second thing I wanted to show you here is a dropout. If you give prevention treatment to anybody, they take the prevention treatment and they don't like it and stop because they had the side effect. If you look at Topiramid, 26% people decided not to continue the treatment because of the side effect. So one in every four people that you give to pyramid wouldn't want to carry on with it. And if you compare it with the Botox, two to 3% people would not like it. And you look at the new monthly injection, 2% people wouldn't like. So this means the retention rate or the rate of continuing the treatment and to stopping the treatment due to side effects is very minimal in these uh, Botox and the new, no new treatment. And this is why I don't like to pyramid. So what's coming soon? So I've got a couple of more slides. Uh, we have got a new treatment that is currently available in USA and it's been, uh, it's, they, they are, thinking about applying for a license in the UK. It's available in the USA at the moment. It's called DITEN. So for acute treatment, if you remember, I said that you've got simple painkillers and you've got tryptin. Now in simple painkiller, a lot of people complain of stomach problem with ibuprofen or they can't take ibuprofen because they have asthma or they have a stomach problem. They call, give them indigestion. And tryptin is good, but some people who have had high blood pressure or heart problems or angina or previous heart attack can't take it, yeah? So therefore, this drug is very similar to tryptin, but it does not give you side effect of uh, high blood pressure or angina or other, because it doesn't work on the heart. It only purely works in the, in the brain. So those people where you couldn't use tryptin because of the fear of heart attacks or angina and other things, this new drug purely works on the brain and not on the heart. Otherwise, it works on the same receptors as tryptin did. And therefore, this will be very useful addition to the acute treatment family. Um, available in the USA, but would be available in the UK in the next couple of years. I think we are a bit slow than Americans uh, to take on things. And the second um, category of uh, medication that is again all approved in the USA, but is still waiting in the, in the uh, UK over the next uh, year or so. Uh, Ubrogepent is the acute treatment. Okay, it's not as good as tryptin, but it would give you some benefit if you can't take the tryptin or the non-steroidal ibuprofen or paracetamol. So it's a valuable addition as an acute treatment. Now these actually work on the CGRP. It's a, it's a drug that works on the CGRP. It's not the antibody that you have monthly injection. This is a, a medication that works on the CGRP. Uh, and it's not as good as tryptin. Look, tryptin is about 16 to 21% better. This is about 6 to 9% better, but it is a valuable addition. Another one on the same category is a remegepent. It, it is used both for acute treatment as well as for preventive treatment. And there is a third one, which is currently in the trial, is etogepent, which is purely for preventive treatment. So these three drugs are gonna come over the next year or so. The first two are actually available in the USA, not in the UK. Uh, they're not as good as tryptin, so they wouldn't be as good as the Dytons, but it would give a, a valuable addition to your availability of treatment. Okay, 
So that's um, I've taken longer than I thought. Um, uh, I thought I'll finish in half an hour, but I've taken longer than that. Uh, so use the best treatment that suits you for your acute attack. For prevention treatment, I have given you the first four drugs. Try to use them. If not, then you have got other uh, modalities available. There are two new treatments coming out in the next year or so. The monthly injection for prevention is currently the best one. Um, try and not take, take painkillers uh, like opiates uh, to avoid risk of the rebound headache. So I'm quite happy to take the questions. I'll stop sharing my slide now. Lovely. Thank you very much, Fayaz. And um, we have had quite a few questions come through. So we will try and get through as many as we can. Um, that was really useful, though. So thank you. Um, so the first question that we had was um, someone was using sumatriptan regularly and it works well, but wanted to know if there were long term side effects of taking it regularly. Well, there aren't long, any long term side effects. I think the main problem is that if you use any painkiller, including the triptan, for more than 10 days in a month, then it can give you a rebound headache. And what a rebound headache is, it actually doesn't, it, the actual medication doesn't give you a headache. It's just that the lack of medication, you develop the headache. So you take the painkiller, the painkiller eases your headache, and the painkiller is out of your system and the headache comes back again. So that's what we call a rebound headache. It's not the drug causing you the headache, it's the regular use of the drug that your body is now giving you headache if you, because you don't take the drug. Apart from that, uh, there aren't long-term side effects. If you're using it for no more than two days a week on an average, or 10 days in a month, you'll be fine. Lovely, thank you, Fayaz. And um, what are the recommended doses of paracetamol and ibuprofen? Well, paracetamol, you can take uh, up to four grams a day. So uh, it usually comes in 500 milligram tablets. So you take two tablets every four to six hours if you need it. Uh, same as ibuprofen is 400 to 600 milligrams and you can take it every four to six hours. So the maximum 2.4 gram. Um, remember that it's not the number of painkillers you take in a day. It's the number of days that you take the painkiller. So I have got patients who tell me, um, look, I divide my sumatriptan into four and I take a quarter every day. So I said, well, you'd rather take two sumatriptan a day, but take it on one day rather than taking a quarter four times a day, four, four days in a week. It's the number of days you take it. It's not the number of the uh, tablets that you take per day. So simple painkillers, paracetamol, uh, non-steroidal like ibuprofen, yeah, try and keep all of them to less than 10 days a month. Lovely, thank you, Fayaz. And we had a, a point raised about um, the, the impact of, of migraine and that it does cause temporary disability. Um, and that when people are having two to three attacks a month with medication that lasts for three days, at least it's very debilitating. And what can be done to manage the additional symptoms of silent migraine? Which silent migraine? Yep. So the, the sort of aura symptoms, I'm, I'm guessing from that, and the other sort of non-head pain symptoms. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a package you get. You, the, the pain is one of the symptoms. The nausea, the vomiting, the sensitivity to light and sound, the aura that you get prior to that, they are all comes in a package of what kind of migraine you have. I think if you're getting for less than three days or less than four days a month, my usual recommendation is that you take the most effective acute strategy. Um, if it still doesn't work, the acute strategy, then we can recommend preventive treatment even for three or four days a month. But try your best to have the best acute treatment. Maybe just take sumatriptan injection. That's one of the best treatments for acute attack. If you can't find a, a, a very effective acute treatment in those three to four days, then I think the preventive treatment is allowed. Now, it really depends. Um, you can't take three days off sick every month. So therefore, if, if, if that is the case, then you need preventive treatment. If, if you are retired, if you don't have any major commitments, it's not affecting the quality of your life too much, then less than three days of headache, I would try and manage with the acute treatment without preventive treatment. Because remember that the preventive treatment you will take will have side effects as well. 
Thanks, Fias. And um, someone's asked, what would be a good rescue treatment if you don't, if the triptans don't work? So if you failed different triptans and they haven't worked? Well, as I said, if triptans don't work, you go back to the simple painkillers like paracetamol and uh, the ibuprofen uh, class of drug. Uh, you could combine triptan with the uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen together. Uh, at the moment, if you uh, do not respond to paracetamol, ibuprofen, and triptan, there is nothing. Um, so therefore, uh, this lesmiditan and the ubro and coming on in the next year or so would be a good alternative. Lovely, thank you. And someone's been prescribed amitriptyline as they have six to 12 migraines a month, but they find that semitriptan works really well, so they'd rather take that for the six to 12 times a month and they really don't want to be taking a daily medication um so what would you suggest well 12 is six is fine and if it works very well so if you get six attacks a month you take sumatriptan and it goes away in two to three hours i would i would quite be happy if you don't want to take any preventive treatment 12 is a bit too much because then you'll cross 10 days of acute painkillers, then if you do not want to take preventive treatment and you want to treat 12 of your days with sumatriptan, you're actually using more than 10. And at some stage, you're gonna end up having um, the rebound headache. Plus also you start to use even more. Thanks, Fires. And someone's asked if there's any further research on the efficacy of SNRIs. Well, there is the only one SNRI that has been looked in the RCT, and that's venlafaxine. Um, SSRIs don't, don't work. Um, SSRI fluoxetine uh, it was studied in a trial in 1998, and that was negative. Uh, SNRI venlafaxine, there is one trial that is positive. So I do use venlafaxine in some patients. Lovely. Um, and can Botox be used on people who take blood thinners? Oh, yes. Yeah, I've got people on warfarin comes in. I think the person who injects you just need to make sure that he knows about it so that whenever he injects you in, your, in the head, he presses it hard to stop bleeding. Otherwise, you'll end up having bruises. Okay, thank you. And can Fremanizumab be used for people over 60 who have thrombosis? Well, I'm using it. Uh, uh, the trials are done on 18 to 65, you remember. Mm -hmm. So all the trials are done in people who are 18 to 65. So unless, you know, the, then the real life data comes and people start, you know, do the have a courage to start using it in less, less than 18 on their own accord and then the data emerges in real life but the the ethics or the um, what you call the um, regulatory authorities would not let you do a trial on people less than 18 or people more than 65 or people who are pregnant so therefore all the data for that would come out in the real life um, but that's 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 how uh, the clinical trials run. Lovely, thank you. And someone says they get lumps on their scalp that seem to be associated with their migraines. They're sensitive and painful during a migraine attack, um, and they seem to be linked to neck pain. Do you come across this much? And if so, what would you say would be a, an effective treatment? I've not seen anybody getting lumps in the head because of migraine. I think it might be something else. Okay, thank you. Um, and are there problems with taking two different triptans on the same day? Um, you can for different attack, but not together. So if you have a, an attack and you use a sumatriptan and it, it doesn't work, then later on in the day, if you have another attack, you can take a different triptan if you want to. Um, just like you can repeat the same triptan twice in 24 hours. So you have to be very careful about that. Don't start experimenting um, with, with two diverse type of treatments as such. Lovely. And someone said, even though some of the CGRPs are available and approved in the UK, NHS trusts are not approving the funding for them. So what can be done about that? Um, well, Ajovi, the frimazinumab, 
is approved by NICE, if the CCGs um, are stopping or not approving it, you can write to NICE. Um, you can use the, the migrant trust to do that. If you inform NICE, and if NICE comes to know that there are CCGs refusing it, that's, you know, NICE can blacklist them basically. Lovely, thank you. And do you have any thoughts on the treatment of persistent migraine aura in the absence of persistent headache? Well, I've used in some of them Botox, uh, who purely get auras, ongoing auras, um, without a lot of headaches, and it, it, the Botox works. So if you've got chronic migraine aura or chronic vestibular migraine, uh, Botox is as good as um, anything else. Great. Um, and someone's recently been diagnosed with hemiplegic migraine um, and they've been put on amitriptyline and the stroke-like attacks have stopped, but every day they get a form of numbness or headache on their left side. Does, it, does that sound like they're having a type of migraine attack every day or is it likely to be a reaction to the tablets? I wouldn't think it's a reaction to the tablets, but I think uh, if it is partly helpful, maybe increase the dose a little bit and you should be fine. And is naproxen suitable for asthmatics? Um, there are few asthmatic who can't take non-steroidal. So if, um, if you are asthmatic and you have tried a non-steroidal like uh, ibuprofen and it has given you problem, then don't take naproxen. But I have seen people who are asthmatic and can tolerate non-steroidal. But general idea is that with asthmatic, uh, make sure that you're not uh, intolerable to the non-steroidal. Thank you. And is there an age limit for the triptans? Well, as I say, the trials are done in 18 to 65. The real data for tryptan is available. I have, I have given triptans to people in 70s, 80s and 90s. If they have got ischemic heart disease, angina or previous heart attack, then you've got to be a bit careful about that. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and someone has asked if there's any advice for treating abdominal migraines in children? Yeah, I mean, if it, it usually causes cyclical vomiting or travel sickness or motion sickness type of uh, symptoms together with abdominal pain. Uh, if it is very troublesome, I think some pediatric uh, migraineologists do suggest pizotipin um, or um, uh, amitriptyline, but I think it's, it's a bit tricky using it if you can tolerate, if the child can tolerate and it's not too much unwell, try and just manage it periodically with the, with the painkiller. Lovely. Um, Faiz, we've got a few more questions. I'm aware of the time. Do you have a few more minutes to yeah, answer them? Yeah. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Um, so someone has said they've tried a Jovi and Lasmiditan in clinical trials. They're about to start a Jovi again, and they would like to know if they will be able to use Lasmiditan for acute treatments once it's been licensed alongside a Jovi. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And if someone's a type 1 diabetic, should they be worried about taking triptans four to five times a month? No. Brilliant. Um, someone's asked, are GPs able to prescribe the CGRP treatments? Sorry, say that again? Are GPs able to prescribe CGRP treatments? No, no it has to come from a headache specialist uh, at the moment because it's quite expensive. Um, I think there is no harm in GPs prescribing it, but the only problem is um, if they don't have expertise in headaches, uh, they would not be able to monitor it. Like I always say, learning how to inject Botox, you can, you can train anybody. You can even train a lay person. And I think a lot of beauticians are doing Botox uh, for migraine. It's not how to inject, that's the easiest thing to do. It's when to start, when to stop. That is the important thing. So the CGRP monoclonal antibody, if the headache physician says carry on prescribing it, the GP can carry on prescribing it. What the GPs can't do or wouldn't be able to do is to recognize when to stop and when to restart. And that's why you need a headache specialist. Lovely, thank you. And someone said um, their son's 15 is on pizotifen at the moment. Would they be uh, suitable to have the injections? I'm assuming they mean the CGRP injections. Absolutely. Lovely. And can you have Amovig at the same time as Botox? 
um, even if you're paying for one privately? Um, we would tend to discourage that. Uh, if you look at the practice of Americans, there are loads of people in America who are on both Amovig and Botox, but they have got a different healthcare system, not just because of the you know, reimbursement issue, but their market is about money. That's what they, they do. The insurance companies um, would do anything to claim money of the industry. So it wouldn't be surprising if you see people in America are on five or six preventive treatment at the same time, because the money doesn't come from the government, it comes from the insurance companies, and they would do anything to get the money out of the insurance companies. Here, it's a problem. There isn't any evidence that the two together would do you good. Um, if in real life, the money wasn't an issue, if it was like American um, system in the UK, I would have thought a lot of people would start prescribing them together, but I see no benefit. Lovely, thank you. And someone's asked, can they continue to take Zolmatriptan after 65? They've been using them for 32 years and find them very effective. Um, they're currently 62. If you don't have angina or ischemic heart disease, that's fine. Lovely. Um, and any recommendations for hormonal migraines when you're already being treated for episodic migraine? See, hormonal migraine is the, is if you get purely hormonal migraine, which would mean that you have got like a menstrual migraine, your migraine start on the day of the period, and then you have it every day for five days, and then it goes away. Then you can actually have the hormone patch a week before your period is due, estradiol patches, or you can have a tryptan one every day, twice a day, every day for five days. That's the usual treatment for hormonal migraine. But if you are taking, if you have got other episodic migraine as well, and you're taking some preventive treatment for that, that should really cover both of them. But if you've got purely menstrual migraine or hormonal migraine, then you can't use hormone patches and tryptan uh, twice daily for five days. Lovely, thank you. And um, has there been any research that shows why a person's threshold lowers? I think that was in relation to the triptans. Well, all we know is that you have to blame your parents for getting the migraine. It comes from the genes. You can't change your parents. They gave it to you. You pass it on to your children. Thank you. And then someone's son is 16 and is prescribed to pyramate 25 milligrams, one tablet at night. He is taking propranolol, but is asthmatic. Can you please go over the dislike of topiramate? He also has daily frequent vomiting from early years. It's a boy. So in, in, in boys and men, I have no problem with topiramate, but I would still try amitriptyline and candisartan before going on to topiramate because of the side effects. Lovely. And someone has said, is there anything that can be done to try and raise thresholds? Um, well, you've got a low threshold, you've got a low threshold. You can only raise threshold through preventive treatment. So all these drugs for prevention, amitriptyline, propranolol, topiramid, they raise your threshold and make it higher. Lovely. And I think there was a point <clears throat> excuse me, earlier, where someone said that the neurologist would only prescribe six triptans at a time and it wasn't, um, it wasn't enough. So any comments on that? Well, I mean, you could persuade your GP or your headache physician can persuade your GP to give you up to 10. I think the GPs are not supposed to give you more than 10 per month because they are actually promoting medication overuse. Lovely. Um, and can the hormone patch be taken if you have migraine with aura due to stroke risk? Um, if you've got migraine with aura, you, you can't take the pill, but you can take a hormone patch, low dose estrogen a week before your period. Lovely. Thank you, Fires. I think that's all the questions.